Good morning, Source family. How you doing? It's so good to see you this morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ken Connery, pastor here at The Source. So glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. I uh, want to let you know that um, here at The Source, we believe in a couple things. One is the work of the Word and the Spirit in our lives, that as we gather, God uh, shows us more of who He is and who He calls us to be through His Spirit and His Word here in worship that leads us into the week. Uh, the other thing we believe in is, is that we as the body need to gather together to be connected, to encourage one another, uh, that the grace of God and the Spirit of God work through us in each other's lives. And so if you're new or you've been here for a long time, we'd love to know you're here. There's a scan code. It'll be on the screen, but it also is in a little card in front of you during the pew. At any point, you can turn that out. Let us, let us know you're here. We'd love to check in with you. Love to see how you're doing. Uh, today, we are in the Gospel of Luke, and we're talking what the church calls the Beatitudes. And so our scripture comes from Luke uh, chapter 6, verses 20 uh, through, let's see, 20 through 26. Uh, and it says this. Then he looked at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when, you, when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now. For you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now. For you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you. For that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. It's the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks be to God. Here's a bold question I'd like to ask this morning. Are the poor blessed? Are the hungry blessed? Are those who are weeping blessed? Are those who are persecuted and oppressed blessed? Are they? Do we believe that? Do we think that's true? You know, so many times when I look out in the world and I, on social media, and I see that hashtag blessed, most of the time it's someone on a vacation in Fiji. You know what I mean? When I hear, many times in conversations, when I hear someone and they say, well, I'm blessed, it seems that they've received something that they aren't lacking, that in fact, they have things. So many times when we hear the word blessed, it really seems to be connected to things that we have, things that we've been given, things that we've earned, through whatever system we may participate in. Are the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the oppressed truly blessed? I had an uh, Old Testament professor um, who said something I'll never forget. He said, he was talking about Old Testament, but he really talking about all Scripture. He said, Scripture is written in a time, in a place for them. There, then, them. There, then, them. It's written for that place during that time for those people. The Gospel of Luke is written to a specific context. Luke is trying to do two things which are really quite opposed to each other. This is the early church. It's the early church under the Roman Empire and the church um, is struggling. One, because they're trying to understand, they thought that the Son of Man was going to come back within a generation, and then that didn't happen. So they're trying to understand what's it mean to be the church for the long term. They're trying 
to survive oppression. The Roman Empire is skeptical, is oppressive on this sect of Jesus followers. So Luke's trying to encourage them, but he's also trying to kind of write an apology. When, and I don't mean saying sorry. I mean like a, like a defense, right? And a, def, a defense of their faith to the Roman Empire to maybe hopefully eliminate some of that suffering that they're having. So, the so Luke is trying to encourage a people to continue with the faith in the midst of oppression and also the thing that's oppressing them kind of give them a defense on what they believe so that maybe they won't be as oppressive. So he's, he's trying to deliver a countercultural message that says you're on the right end of history, Rome is wrong, and he's also trying to tell Rome not to worry about them. <laughs> that's quite the task, right? Quite the task. But the writer of Luke is, is writing to try to address this in the church. And what Luke is saying here is countercultural to what we believe is true in this world. Because we in the world believe that those who have are blessed. That those who have are the blessed ones. That they're the ones that matter. They're the ones who have done things right. We even sometimes like, you know, sometimes I was kind of reflecting on the scripture and I was, I was kind of amazed at how many times we like almost like make people who are very successful divine. Like we call them titans of industry. Titans meaning kind of like, right, this, this old theology on like a, a, a Greek and Roman theology on like, on like old gods. Like we're basically, when we call someone like a titan, we're calling them like a god, right? So we have these titans of industry who are just in, insanely wealthy in this world, we call them titans and, and we're envious and we're like they've, like we, we believe they've earned all that wealth. And by believing we've earned all that wealth, we also believe that the fact that there are billionaires and trillionaires in this world and yet people still starve, we believe they're the blessed ones. We justify it. We're fine with it. Because ultimately we kind of want it. Because we believe what it means to be blessed is to fight for mine and ours. That as long as my life is secure, I'm blessed. Other people don't quite matter. Yet, the gospel message, and especially the honed focus gospel message here in Luke, tells us that the reality of God is just quite frankly the opposite. Christ begins his ministry by saying he will bring equity to this world. That those who are poor and suffering will be brought up. That they will be given. That we will be restored. That this will be in the invitation to all creation. That God's kingdom radically values and in fact focuses and hones in on those who suffer in this world saying that they are valuable. God does not condone suffering. He does not condone building wealth, building our lives at the cost of others. And so we get to the woe part, which is the scary part of the scripture, right? Woe to you who are rich. Because you've received everything you're going to get. Woe to you who are full. You're going to be hungry. You who are laughing, you're going to weep. Those who speak well of you, it's empty. There's also this kind of vein of judgment, which is... Where church gets scary, right? Judgment. God's judgment. But here's the beautiful thing about the witness of Christ. Here's what Luke is trying to show his people. 
that are suffering, that are hungry, that are poor, that are weeping. That God's compassion transforms this world. That God's love and compassion transform this world. God will defeat evil. Luke draws a hard line, but it's not about saying in and out. It's about saying what matters. God wants to bring those high lower and those lower higher that every soul would be valuable. What we have here is a proclamation that every soul in this world has value. Luke is telling the people, the church, that you have value. The system, the power, the country that you live in says you do not have value. But the Savior, the Christ, the, the, the Creator God says you do. And you are on the right side of what matters. God will bring equity He will create equality. His compassion will transform. And what we see in the gospel message before this scripture, before this blessing, before this teaching of Christ, is that Christ comes and he begins to heal and restore people. Luke is speaking right to his context, saying, look, Christ came. He healed this person with leprosy. Do you know what that means? It doesn't mean that he was just healed from an ailment. It means that he was restored to the community, that he was able to have relationships again, that he was able to be seen as a person, as valuable, as worthwhile, as worth being around, as a worthy soul. Christ came to heal and restore so that we might see the value of every soul. He's saying, don't let the message of the world say what matters. Listen to the Savior. Listen to the Creator. Listen to what God's purposes is, and that is equity and equality for all souls. And we see Jesus have compassion. We see Jesus, even the people who have wealth, right, those who come and they, 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 they accept this message, they give to the needy, they, they love the community, right, Christ embraces them. It is only those who refuse, who refuse to even consider that the poor and the sinner have value. It is those in which Christ rejects in his ministry. It is those who won't even give that message the time of day. It's not that there's just an in and out group. It's the, is there a come and see just even a desire to pursue something better than what we have in this world. And how does Luke encourage the people? He says, this is not a war. It's not about, you know, (laughs) you know, it's not about the poor waging war against the rich and defeating them. But no, right after that, Christ calls us to love even our enemies, to show that same compassion that Christ has shown us to everyone that we encounter, even those that we perceive as enemies. And then he encourages the community not to just judge others, not to judge others, but to forgive, to forgive, to extend that mercy even when those who wrong us do so. And what that does is that it transforms our hearts, that it seeks to take root in our heart, that as we seek that in our heart at the deepest places, that the fruit begins to bear from that pursuit. And if we allow that gospel message, if we allow that message of compassion by our our Savior to take root, if we allow that that proclamation that we need to have a value for the least of these to take root. What we are building is a firm foundation on which we can face all trials, all trials.
The ultimate purposes of God is to bring about radical human acceptance and equality with each other. And as the church, you know, as even little kids, it, it's, it's a message that speaks to us in every phase of life. Because ultimately, it's hard to share. <laughs> it's just hard to share. It's hard to share what, what we have. But as the gospel continues, as the root of God's message for the least of these, as God's special presence and spirit comes to those who are told they are nothing to deliver a word of compassion and God's ultimate desire for everyone to love and care not only for God but for each other and themselves, we see the church become that in Acts. The person who wrote Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And what we see in Acts is a, a church that begins with radical sharing, compassion, and caring gathered around the word of God. It says they committed themselves to the apostles' teaching, to gathering, and to the breaking of bread. That The early church just gathered and simply tried to work out and live out compassion with each other. And in that space, the spirit of God takes root. In that place, the gospel message begins to grow, begins to transform, begins to heal, in which the reality of the poor being blessed, the hungry being fed, those who are weeping, being comforted and cared for, those who are suffering oppression are told that they are more worthy than that experience. That is reality in the church. That God is working in this world to do this work. And we have ultimate hope that it will happen. We have ultimate desire for it to come here and now. But it is a reality we live as the church here and now. My professor also said, it's about there, it's about then, it's about them. But when you look at that, when you see that, you begin to see it's about here. It's about now. It's about us. It's about us. The church is the place where the poor are blessed. The hungry are blessed. Those who mourn are blessed. Those who are oppressed are blessed. We live that out faithfully in whatever we can, way we can in the system and the powers that are our context. But that message, that call, that compassion has always rooted us and will continue to root us until Christ's return. I, you know, as I reflect on my own life and how this has taken root, you know, I grew up a pretty angry kid, mad at the world, and I believed that I had to just fight for whatever I could get. And, you know, I had a transforming moment in college that really brought me into what compassion in community looks like and really shaped me in profound ways of, of living out love and care for my neighbor. But... I realized this week in reading it that the seed of that was planted so much earlier. I have a best friend. I've known him since I was 11. And he had this gift of inviting everyone to our group. He would just invite anyone and everyone to join us. Even the people, like, you know, <laughs> you might be in school right now or even as adults, it, even the people you didn't want invited into the group to, the, to be present, he would invite them into the group. He just has the gift of radical inclusion, just, just unnaturally so. And he invited me into the group. That's how I got connected. And he did silly things like he would lead, like he would just ask us and we would spend weeks talking about what superhero we think each other were. And somehow in that presence, it's like we started encouraging each other and saying like, hey, I think you're Batman because you're strong and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're independent and you really go after it. And so we're like telling each other what our superheroes, I, I, what I didn't realize at the time, what I realize now is us talking about our superheroes was us living out the gospel message. 
That that radical inclusion, simply just inviting people into the space and having conversations, looking at someone and saying, here's something I value about you, is living out the gospel, and I just didn't know it. If you're here today and you're in the younger side of our brothers and sisters, I need you to know that the gospel message is just as alive as you as it is in the, in the older people among you. And the same goes for the older among you. You, are not, you have not been so scorned by the world that you are worthless, but that the value of your soul is alive, alive in Christ, alive in his, in his love, that you have value and you have that same opportunity before you. If we really, truly live our lives out in the same way that Luke calls us to, radical gathering, inclusion, and compassion for each other, we will begin to see the world transformed in our lives and the lives around us. The world says that you are blessed on what you take. But our Savior says, you are blessed when you give. You are blessed when you give. The Spirit of God is in that space in a more potent way than we could ever believe. The blessings of God are alive in the most honest, raw, hurting places of this world. If you want to find the presence of God, go there. Be present. Listen. Include yourself in it. And practice compassion. And you will see the word of God and the spirit of God alive. Absolutely alive. One of the things that I believe is not only inclusion in the body of Christ um, just on a cultural level or a social level, but on an age level. The young adults in our midst have a beautiful way of telling us where the church needs to ask questions where we need to be challenged, what we need to be challenged by. They are a gift among us. Our children, the young in our midst are a gift from God. The presence of God is alive in them in ways that I don't know if we fully appreciate all the time. They are a gift. And today is Senior Sunday, a day we celebrate the young. We celebrate the presence of God that is alive in them as they continue to journey in life, as they continue to go and take steps forward, to ask questions about who they are, who God calls them to be. They are a gift and a guide to us to ask those same questions alongside them, to be alongside them, to be in community with them, to include them in the conversations that we have and to listen to the voice in which they speak in our context and to be transformed by the compassion that they show us and we show them. It is a beautiful celebration on the life of the church. The fact that the gospel of Luke was not the last time in which this message needed to be delivered, but that in every generation of the church that has come after that and before that, as God has continued to love his creation, that that message continues to take root in the generations that unfold, that the will of God, the blessings of the poor, that the poor are being cared for, that the hungry are being fed, that those who mourn are being comforted, that those who are breast are being valued, that is in every generation that the church takes that mantle and marches forward as a testimony against the brokenness of this world, believing in the grace of the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ. They are a reminder of our call. And they are a reminder of our future hope. 